Now, let's welcome our first guest. Mitre Vang has had a busy week. It isn't every day you learn you are a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Welcome, Mitre, to CMAC. Thanks for having me. I, I'm so excited that you are here. Now, often we see images of journalists in newsrooms who are waiting for the Pulitzer announcements and they all have champagne, so obviously they've been tipped off, but that was not the case with you, is that correct? Yeah, the, the way that it works is that you, uh, you, you suddenly just get a bunch of text messages and then you find out that you either won or you were a finalist. Um, and so, yeah, that's sort of what happened with me. I, I had no idea that the book was even in consideration. And what, where were you when you found out? I was actually um, finishing up a class. I had finished up the class already and I was just kind of tidying things up and wrapping things up and, and checking messages and such. And then my partner shared the message and information with me and I was just, I was blown away. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. Well, what, that's kind of a fun, great way to, to learn about it. Yeah, no, it's great. It's, it's great to, to, you know, just, and in fact, the class I was finishing was a poetry class too, which is just, uh, you know, so serendipitous because I was, you know, finish, you know, sharing this, my love of poetry with my students and then to be able to, to be recognized for that was just even better. So let's, let's talk about Yellow Rain. Um, this is, it's a fascinating subject. It's one that I didn't know anything about until I started reading your book. Um, people have described it as um, collaging, a, f a form of poetry where you kind of bring words together and text together. And also, um, there's, there's another term for it, documentary poetics. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of explain, first of all, kind of the format of your book? Yeah, so the book is a collection of um, poems, um, and the poems, um, you know, they're, so you have your, your, you sort of have your normal poems in there, but then um, what I've done is that between the poems, I've also interspersed these compositional pieces that are very visual, very collage-based, and, um, and draw from various source documents that I was using when I was writing the book, so a lot of declassified documents, archival material. And so I took them and I examined the possibilities of what would happen if I uh, laid them out spatially in relationship to each other on a page. And so that's what became, that's what sort of created and became those compositional pieces. Before we move on, I just want to cover some basic info here because like I say, some of, some of this stuff is unknown to, to people out there. Um, you are Hmong. You write about the Hmong American experience. Can you tell us again, just kind of give us a refresher, what time period are we talking about with Yellow Rain? Um, what were the events of the war that, mm -hmm. that led to all this? Yeah, so, um, so for me, um, you know, I, I'll start with myself though. I, I, as a daughter of Hmong refugees, I was born in the very early 80s um, here in the United States, uh, just after my parents resettled. But to backtrack a little bit on how they became refugees and then how, uh, you know, the events of the war that prompted then what became Yellow Rain, that prompted then, you know, people like my parents, um, you know, fleeing their homeland to the to then come here to the United States. Um, the war, uh, you know, the, the war in Vietnam, the U.S. war in Vietnam and, and in Laos had come to a decisive end in 1975. And at that time, um, what had happened was the United States had recruited, um, before that, obviously, before that, the, they had recruited, you know, a lot of Hmong men and soldiers to fight communism on behalf of the United States in what I would consider was a proxy war. Right? It was a way for the United States to be able to use the bodies and the labor of Hmong men to do the, 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 the bidding of the war for them. And so when that, was, uh, when that came to an end in 1975 and the U.S. Uh, left the country and sort of kind of evacuated and abandoned all of, the, all of the refugees to kind of fend for themselves, that's when everyone fled for their lives. Right? That's when everyone was uprooted and said, we cannot live here, it's not safe anymore. We will be, um, we will be you know, attacked, we, you know, our lives are at stake, uh, we, we have to leave everything behind. And that's the story of a lot of Hmong refugees who found their way to the United States was because of that, right? Because of this need to, to find safety. 
And so the process of that then leads to what becomes yellow rain because as they're fleeing in the jungles, a lot of them report this mysterious substance that falls from the sky and lands on their body and it's falling from these airplanes that are dropping them. Um, and uh, it falls on the plants, on the, on the, on the, the water, their, on their clothing, and it's making people sick. And so my book explores what this thing is, but it also explores the political fallout of it. So there was an incident involving Alexander Haig, the, the then Secretary of State of the United States, that really kind of brought this, kind of made it explode in the world. Can, can you tell us about that? Yeah, so what happened in 1981, I believe it was around uh, September 1981, um, he, you know, the U.S. had been investigating what this substance was, right? They had no idea. Um, and so it was like, let's find out what it is because we need to know if we are being threatened by something else in the world. Um, and so the U.S. conducted this massive eight-year investigation. Um, and what they did was they took blood samples, they took urine samples, they took leaf samples from refugees to try to figure out what this was. And they, there was one leaf sample that, um, that a scientist uh, from, from the University of Minnesota, Chester, Dr. Chester Marocha, had discovered some traces of toxins on there. And so using that one leaf, the United States began to build its case and say, yes, this is a chemical biological weapon. And so uh, the then Secretary of State, Alexander Haig, at that time, uh, you know, we're coming up now to 1981 in October, He's in Berlin and he's at a press conference and then he just announces that the United States has evidence that the Soviet Union is using chemical biological weapons in Southeast Asia. And that is what then launches and balloons into this, this fiasco that would become yellow rain. Tell us about some of the effects of, of this substance. I know that some of them are pretty horrific. Yeah, so the, the, there was like a, it sort of ranged from, you know, some moderate symptoms to some more severe and fatal symptoms. So, you know, at, you know, at the more moderate level, people reported um, things like being very dizzy, blurry eyes, vomiting, um, bloody diarrhea, to something more uh, fatal like hemorrhaging and, and just lesions on their skins and, and just, you know, um, you know, just bodies that would just kind of die and, and, and it was just, it, it was not like, it would just kind of quickly turn into a form of necrosis, like the, you know, and, and people didn't want to go near those bodies either. They didn't know what was going on. And so there was so much mystery around, around those deaths. Um, but there were many, many people who reported, you know, even just something as basic as like having bloody diarrhea or, um, you know, you know, just losing their vision. Um, now, these incidents took place after your parents had left. Is that is that the case? Or? You know, it, it's all kind of within the same time frame, okay. I would say, you know. And did they talk about this at all? Or when did you first learn about it? Yeah, Yellow well, Red? they certainly did not talk about it. They did not it. talk about it. <laughs> yes, it was sort of a, a sort of something that they, that most, I imagine that most elders really weren't ready to talk about yet. Um, and I discovered Yellow Rain when I was doing research on the secret war um, during my undergraduate years in college, you know, I was just sort of s studying up on it, and I discovered this thing called yellow rain, and I said, this doesn't make any sense. Bee feces? I mean, we'll get to that, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it stayed with me, and I said, I gotta follow up on this. Some later on in my life, when I have time and resources, um, maybe I should look into this more. Now, there is a twist here. You mentioned bee feces. Um, when did that pushback start? Yeah, so as the investigation on Yellow Rain continued and the U.S. was kind of doing its thing, really wanting to kind of make its case that this was, be, uh, this was a biological weapon, there were other uh, people in the scientific community and in the political community who were also very adamant about pushing back against that theory and wanting to, uh, to sort of potentially offer another, well, I mean, to offer another theory with the intention of sort of challenging the political landscape of that time. And so that contingency of people 
offered the theory that this was not a biological weapon, that in fact it was just the feces of honeybees, just defecating on the Hmong people as they were running through the jungles. And that's, that was the theory. And as it stands today, that is, the, that is the theory that is still used and given when people talk about yellow rain. And I was reading that you know, supposedly scientists have discovered it happens at certain times when the temperature is warmer and the, the bees have to excrete a certain amount of their, their body weight. Um, I guess my reaction to that when I first read about it was, wouldn't this have been something that had been happening for centuries? Like, wouldn't it be part of the, the Hmong culture and the lore of, okay, we've got our yellow rain, it's the bees? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I agree that, that it would have been part of the collective knowledge of what people knew um, would be the case. But it wasn't, you know? It wasn't. And uh, I mean, I, I, imagine that, I imagine that people might have known about it, but it wasn't something that was clearly like, you know, collective knowledge amongst everyone there or amongst most people. Miter, th this book is so fascinating and, and touching, and it is just really com complex. Um, one, one of the things that I, I wanted to ask you about is, is what you saw as your, your role here, because it seems like you're sort of a historian, you're sort of an investigative journalist, but you're also a poet, and you, you come out with a point of view, and you say, that is my right as a poet. So could you speak to that? Yeah, I think that that's, that's a great sort of observation to make because I think when I was writing this book, I was struggling and contending with all these different sort of roles that I was thinking I was doing with the book. And I, it, was part of, it was part of why I think I wanted to do these collage pieces too, was to be able to offer um, and the my reader a glimpse into the documents but to and and to also immerse them in these documents with me you know here's what i would have found from maybe a journalistic point of view um but then the poetry comes in because i'm a poet and i write poetry and i've studied poetry and um and there with poetry i find that there is such dexterity and fluidity with what i can do in language and with language that will allow me to get closer to the truth of what I want to say. When we talk about documents, these are literal government documents. You have toxicology reports, you have uh, blood tests. Um, can you tell us, you, you do have one poem called um, Blood Cooperation. Mm -hmm. And it's very important how you decided to kind of design or lay out your words on the page. Yeah, that poem I, I think is a is a sort of interesting one. I think back to doing that poem, and I was just I just remember when I was writing it, I was just feeling so frustrated at all of the reports I was reading about these refugees who had given up their blood samples, hundreds of them, and and and, and I mean I came across hundreds, but I knew there were thousands of them. And yet none of them had heard back anything about their results. Um, there was the government wasn't getting any closer to finding out what this harmful substance was, and yet people were just kind of giving up their bodily fluids. And, and Hmong people are not, I mean, no one's gonna want to just give up your bodily fluids. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was, that, 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 that was very distressing for, the, for a lot of Hmong refugees. And so that poem is rooted in that, that feeling of distress, of giving yourself up over to this larger uh, government to serve their political cause mm -hmm. without even knowing what was gonna happen or what the result even was or the outcome. And you'll see that in the background of that poem as a water Mark, I, I, you know, was able to. I found this image of blood sample labels, um, and I, I thought, you know, like if I could sort of superimpose that, you know, underneath or even on top. It looks like it could be on top of the poem in some ways, um, you know, as as a, as sort of the kind of like an echoed image in the background or a kind of a ghost image in the background um, to complement the poem. That, that really adds right. adds to that experience. Yeah. Um, you, you, told, you told an interview, you, were, you said, um, while the documents serve as a form of authority, um, they weren't the ones writing the poems. 
I was. Mm -hmm. I was very struck by that, that quotation. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, again, we get back to this idea that you as the poet, as the artist, you as someone who coming from this uh, as a subjective experience, right. you have to make that final call. Right, right, yeah. So I, while the documents are their own kind of authority, um, they are not the ones writing the poems, I am. And so I uh, am able to sort of serve as the authority of how to do these poems. And that then gives me some agency to figure out how to position them, how to sort of take words and pair them together with other words to offer um, a different lens, a different narrative into the issue of Yellow Rain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So your collection of poems seems to kind of progress from the, the documentary style to near the end of, of your book, it seems like you're getting more into the idea of grief. Would you say that's the case? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that. I, you know, because I, I worried about how intense the history would be for a collection of poetry and, and how that would be received by my reader. I, I mean, of course, in, in, you know, when you're writing, you, you, you don't know how anyone will receive your book and, and not, you're not writing the book to be received in any way, really. Um, you know, so, so, I, I, I thought, okay, well, I, I've really sort of made this really sort of history heavy on the front end, and now I'm taking it to a place of reflection, but also reckoning, too, you know, um, and, and I, I hope that, like that, I hope that comes out through the poems too. But yeah, the grief absolutely does come through by the end. I hope it does. And yeah. there are still some unexplained things out there. I mean, you got, one of your poems is called um, Syndrome Sleep Sudden. And it's about the fact that, I guess, was it 50 young Hmong men just right. died in their sleep? Yeah. And there's no real explanation. Right, yes, yes. And some people have, some, some, some uh, doctors and some scholars have traced that potentially back to Yellow Rain, although there's no definitive evidence, right? Right, yeah. right. Well, Mitre, we're, we're running out of time, but I could sit here and talk all afternoon about this. I just wanted to shift over to one other question um, about being a Fresno State professor. How did your students respond to learning that you had been nominated? And what is your take on teaching them? I know that you've made that a priority, to make teaching a priority. Yeah, I, I just, I love teaching, and I'm so grateful to be teaching at Fresno State and in the community, um, you know, that I grew up in, right, because I'm born and raised here in Fresno, and and for me, it's, an, it's just an absolute honor to be able to share this work with my students, but not only that, but to share sort of the, the craft of putting this together and to help, to hopefully, you know, sort of guide them in their own process of learning how to do poetry and how to write poetry and, and, and uh, help them see the potential too of their work has been really inspiring to me, for sure. Well, thank you for, for coming and talking with us today. We should say that um, Yellow Rain and your first book, After Land, right. are, are both available wherever you can buy books or where, wherever you can click, I guess, to buy books. And are you working on a new book at the time, or are you going to yeah. take a rest? You know, I, I think that's always the hope is that uh, you 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 kind of get through one book and you're going to stop. But you know, um, for now, um, I, I've got some projects in the work, maybe another collection of poetry, but nothing concrete yet. Okay. <laughs> well, we're we're looking forward to whatever you come up with next. Great. Thank you so much for having me. And, and thank you.